So with everything going relatively well, it was time for a bit of an upgrade, and this is when the studio was moved over to Emeryville, California, which is where Pixar would continue for quite some time. Uh, they're like, alright, we need to shuffle over here. Now, <clears throat> as I already mentioned, they already sat down and workshopped a bunch of ideas, and this was the last one that they had pushed forward during that particular workshop. It's like, okay, monsters, but... They, they go through the doors and they scare people, but not because they're mean, but because they have to. Okay, cool. Now, I thought about sitting here and summarizing the dozens of different iterations that story went through. I'm not going to. You can look it up if you want, because it really was just change upon change upon change upon change. And you're probably wondering, why? What was so difficult about this one? Well... First of all, Disney was still mandating that this not be a scary film, which makes sense. While Pixar did want to do slightly more adult themes and concepts, something they would start to push for in, for example, Incredibles, they still wanted to have this be accessible to children, and they still had to because Disney was still the one distributing this. So they're like, how do we do a film about monsters who deliberately scare you coming out of your closet? Like, how, how, how do we make that work? How do we sell that? And everyone was like, oh, gosh. And what's worth noting is, despite the Disney connection, and I've certainly spoken ill of Disney for this, and will continue to do so, but this wasn't just a Disney problem. It's a legitimate creative issue. You can't... I mean, you could sell a film like that, but only if you're doing it with a certain tint. And they just kept running into that wall of, how do we make this work? How do we sell the core issue of monsters scaring kids? Now, how many of you have seen uh, the marketing tent, or the promos, or the adverts, or the trailers, or the thumbnail on this very video? You may or may not notice that there is a deliberate and constant effort by the by everyone involved to make it look as lighthearted and silly and happy and funny as possible by using the presentation to massively distance it from monsters deliberately professionally scaring kids, they were able to try and ease into that. And this was a constant, near-total bombardment when it came to the marketing campaign. Even now, if you just look on the, the Blu-ray cover, for example, you still see the same approach being used. And considering this is actually one of the more light-hearted of the Pixar films, even counting the Toy Story stuff, that makes a degree of sense. And is one of the last light-hearted ones we're going to have for a little bit while we're on the subject, but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So, okay, we, we've got that, we've got this idea, and we need to try and present it. And it's all about presentation. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But they decided they couldn't, or at least didn't want, to torpedo the idea. So they decided to just layer all of the, all of the problems that they had and couch that and pad that with the defense of presentation so that people would be willing to take it in and be like, okay, cool. They also turned it into a plot point, but I'll cover that a little bit later. Billy Crystal. Now, this is funny. I don't think I mentioned this in full back in Toy Story 1. Billy Crystal was approached to voice Buzz Lightyear. Now, I want you to think about that for just a second. Picture Buzz Lightyear with Billy Crystal's voice. Because I can't. However, oh, yeah, yeah. however, he the main reason he walked away from that project, he, he was he was the pick. He was he had done a good audition and they were ready to go for him. And he was like, N no, it's animation. Animation, it it's not going to do anything. It's not going to make any money. It's just an anime. Oh, it's one of the most best-selling films of the era and the third best-selling. Okay, okay. I've decided to go ahead and be a part of Pixar because money, money, money. No offense to Billy Crystal. It's just funny that that was his motivation. When he was called on to do Monsters, Inc., he leapt on the opportunity. And I will admit, Billy Crystal does a pretty good Mike Wazowski. Now, real quick, this one was done by Pete Doctor. Funny thing, I looked up how to pronounce it, and it's just pronounced Doctor, so sure, we'll just go with that. But Mr. Doctor started working on it, and started pushing it, and what's funny is this is probably their most low-tier film to date, because the film itself is probably the most broad uh, Pixar film that we've had thus far. It tries to appeal to the largest audience base and tries to accomplish the most all at the same time. Whether it succeeds or not is up to you, and I'm not here to ju judge or to say where it sits on any ranking. I'm just pointing out the facts. This is something that they were deliberately doing because, well, 
there's conflicting reports on that. Either Mr. Doctor himself was so worried about the premise and the, the creative stint that he was like, all right, let's just make this the generic film. And I don't mean generic as a bad thing, by the way. Generically good, right? Like generically appealing to everyone, which is kind of one of the things Pixar is known for. And trying to not really stretch out narratively. Instead, what they try to do is stretch out in terms of animation. This was another big boost in animation. Now, I have, I believe I've said this before, but to reiterate, this is probably the single biggest to jump forward in quality when it comes to the animation. While each film we've covered so far has been a noticeable bump up in terms of you know, capacity, this one was a leap forwards. There were two big things they got together. First is FITST, which is short for physics tool. And the second is the Global Intersection Analysis Program. Now, both of these things are things that have actually been the bane of animators, both in literal drawn as well as CGI, since forever. Because animating something like, okay, it's a bad example. We'll use this as an example, hair. Hair just doesn't animate normally. It, 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 the way it acts and interacts with itself, especially if something goes through it or if it moves around or if it's soft or if there's wind blowing or whatever, that's the kind of thing that usually has to be done manually and was just a nightmare. And trying to animate it with some kind of simulation didn't work and kept causing issue after issue after issue. The other issue is, of course, clothing. Anybody who's played virtually any video game ever knows about the clothing problem, because clothing, A, moves very naturally and smoothly in real life, to the point where it just kind of reacts to things. You know, just reacts to movement. The other problem, though, is it would clip. People had figured out quite a bit earlier, arguably in the PS1 era, but definitely in the PS2 era and early animation stuff, how to make clothing kind of react to stuff, but it would constantly clip through things. In fact, off the top of my head, I can only think of three video games that actually do not have cloaks or, or clothing or whatever that clip through or don't clip. You know, everything just kind of does that because simulating that is a nightmare process. But they wanted to accomplish both things here. They actually came, so the first thing they came up with was FITS, the physics tool thing. Now, there's entire documentaries done just on this, so I'm just going to give you a brief overhaul, because what it did was it ran a completely separate process, and what, what the way it would work is they would animate and render the scene, and certain things that were supposed to be simulated didn't exist yet. The rules for them existed, like a specific hair, but that's it. You had the rule for hair and how it was supposed to react to stimuli like movement or wind or direction or whatever. And so you would render Sully and then they would paint Sully with the hair and then they would render the, then they would play the scene. But as the scene is playing and as the data of movement and all that is going through, it would run that through the simulator, which would then actually simulate what the hair should be doing. This was also a bit of a follow-through on the tech they came up with for the dust that I mentioned back in Toy Story 2, which itself was also something developed based on the copy-paste algorithmic thing they did for the ants back in A Bug's Life. You can see how it progresses. Now again, I'm giving a super, super basic level understanding of this. I highly recommend, if you're interested at all, going ahead and just watching the behind-the-scenes yourselves, because they cover it in far more detail than I can. The end result is extremely impressive, and actually, in hindsight, makes perfect sense. What they're effectively doing is rendering twice. Render the base stuff, then render the detail stuff, and have a totally separate program just um, react to that. But hang on. They had a problem. The biggest problem was all the fur just kept clipping with itself, just constantly going through itself, and it's like, and then, and then, and then. that doesn't work at all. And of course... That's the clothing problem, too. What the, heck? the clothing... Because they figured out pretty early on that this fits tool would enable them... Ow, that was my ankle. Would enable them to be able to simulate clothing and other, you know, stuff that is supposed to react. This is a huge tool in their arsenal as animators because, well, as anyone will tell you, <laughs> when it comes to animation, doing it manually versus doing it man partially manually and then setting up a program to simulate the auto autonomic stuff or the automatic stuff, the latter is going to be better in almost every single case, right? It, it, it's, it's an insanity and a huge time cost uh, detriment 
You know, it's it's not worth the time and cost investment in order to have animators sit down and animate every hair individually and every leaf on the tree and every blade of grass and so forth and so on. There's so many things that it's just not worth animating manually if you can have a program cover just that thing. So being able to do this not only opened up even more doors for them to animate stuff in the future, but massively cut down on costs and expenditure and, most importantly, time. Remember, in direct pushback to Toy Story 2, they were not going back to that crunch time stuff. None of that. So, now granted, this is a different team which started work at the same time, but you, you get the general point. There was a lot of pushback, and understandably so, about that crunch. So... Good idea. This is also why this film was relatively expensive compared to some of the previous ones, for the same reason that Bug's Life was, because they dumped most of the expense of the filmmaking into developing even more tech to give them even more tools so they can do even better work. It's, it's the Pixar process, and arguably that would continue for about three-ish more years. And after that, most of the tech advances were just natural iterations of the existing stuff. But this was a big one, the FITZT tool and the Global Intersection Analysis tool. This is how they solved the clipping problem. They ran a third render. So the third render, it's actually, it's actually a lie. It's more like it's a second process happening during the uh, second render. So we've got two processes running. One simulates the movement. Two detects and it effectively uh, treats the mesh as if it has a surface to tell it not to clip through, but instead to bounce off of. This is probably the more impressive tool of the two, as strange as that may sound, because what this allowed them to do was to make things look realistic without, well, looking like a PS2 cutscene. <laughs> I don't have another way to put that. Because now clipping is solved. Now they can animate clothing realistically. Now they can animate hair realistically and grass and leaves and all the other fun stuff that we could talk about. And we will see plenty of these in the future. And it won't look like it's cheating. Because it's not. So this is a brilliant push forward, technologically speaking. And was a huge... Argue, I would argue this is the biggest sea change in the animation process. And that I've already said that. and So I'm repeating myself at this point. <clears throat> Believe it or not, that's most of the stuff I have to say about the behind the scenes, with one notable exception. This is the first film to start having high-profile lawsuits against it. Now, why is that significant? Because lawsuits take a while to get going, and to happen, and to be resolved, and all that fun stuff. And, well, most of these lawsuits were in the range of, oh, give me money. No offense to actual legitimate lawsuits, but I have a tremendous amount of bile in my mentality and thought for money lawsuits, where someone is literally just trying to make a cash grab. And both of the lawsuits being leveled at this film, in my opinion, were cash grabs. This is even more relevant because of the fact of how they were done. And again, you can read the behind the scenes. One of the things they insisted was the film couldn't be released until they were, until the lawsuit was settled, AKA a blackmail. <laughs> just to put that as bluntly as I can. You can pay me out and I'll let the suit go. <sighs> Anyways, <clears throat> so there was some money lawsuits, and that makes sense. Pixar is now a big enough name and is making enough money that now they're a target for people who do money lawsuits. So that's great. One of those benefits of being up top. <sighs> Anyways, let's get to the film proper. Uh, I do want to mention one thing really quick. We've got three, four, actually, five actors I want to talk about. First, Goodman and Crystal. Now, John Goodman actually nails it here. He just so naturally sounds like Sully. It's hard for me to imagine anyone else voicing him. But the important part is they pulled this Toy Story trick with him and Crystal. Again, the overwhelming majority of the lines are recorded separately. And then they're just tossed in and the voice directors kind of work with them and give them an idea of what they're doing in the moment of the scene so they know which intonations to use. It's good stuff, but it's just, it's never going to be quite the same as two people who are literally acting off of each other. So they got Crystal and Goodman into the same room together and had them act off of each other. And in fact, the two ad-libbed a decent amount and just kind of joked around and got a good rapport going and it bleeds out into the film obviously. The other thing I wanted to mention is Frank Oz is in this film. Now, you probably know Frank Oz because he's Frank Oz, but he, he plays Fungus, the red dude, the, the assistant for Randall. I would have never guessed that. Real talk. That is impressive. The other thing, of course, I want to mention is James Coburn, who plays Water News. 
I've always actually been a pretty big fan of James Coburn, but I'll admit, this is so sad, I'll admit I tend to remember him more for his villainous roles, which is the stuff he started doing effectively after he retired. He was good in the old days, don't mistake me, but those are the roles that I tend to remember the most. Probably my personal favorite is Maverick, if you've seen that. If you haven't, I recommend it. It's a, it's a poker film, but no, it's good, trust me. Anywho, <clears throat> the last one I'll talk about in a little bit. Let's talk about world building. So, what the heck is going on in this film? This is probably the most clear-cut example of a concept film, and one that, really, the more you think about it, the less it makes sense. I have actually come up with a few methods to make this all make sense, and I did a little Reddit perusing before I, I jumped into this while, while I was watching the film, and I noticed that quite a few other people have tried to make sense of this one as well. Uh, I saw a theory that there was a horrible plague, probably the Black Death is usually referenced, and that's why everyone assumes humans are so toxic, because they were toxic at one point in time. Um, I've seen theories about the nature of this being a uh, minuscule area. Actually, the more I think about this one, the more I like it. The idea being that the monster's world is actually really small. In this film, all we ever see is the city. And, well, if we cheat and add Monsters University here, well, Monsters University could still be part of the city. So we still only really see the city. It doesn't really expand all that much. We just get out into, like, the suburbs area. So the total real estate that is both stated and implied is relatively small. To, to explain what I mean by this, contrast this with, say, Cars 2. Cars 1 could have been relatively small, but Cars 2 showed that there is quite a large world still out there, even internationally, other nations and across the ocean kind of a thing. And, well, we'll talk about Cars 2 when we'll get that. My point is, with such evidence, we can then state, as, you know, as theory crafters, okay, there is a planet, an Earth planet in Cars. But what is there in Monsters, Inc.? And again, we are shown very, very little to accommodate that. We do see that the Earth is there, but that's separate. That's the human world. And I'm not saying the monster world is necessarily small, but it would make perfect sense if it was, especially since one of my theories is that it's a pocket dimension. We also see that there's an energy crisis. Now, one of the things they insist on constantly is the fact that the energy crisis is specifically happening because kids are harder to scare. And yet, if I might be so bold, I don't really see any evidence of that. With the level of organization and access and resources they have, they seem to be able to produce plenty of energy. It's just not meeting demand. If I might jump in here a little bit, I think the problem isn't the fact that they can't make enough energy. I think the problem is that they are spending too much energy. That they have, that their society has developed and expanded so far, and they use electricity for everything, just like you know we do, that their needs are outweighing it. And I think there's simply a plateau when it comes to the energy input that they can get from scaring. And they've reached it. And I think that's the issue. And that is a little bit different from we're dipping in terms of energy intake. Instead, it's more we are dipping in terms of how much energy we're keeping up with, which is a different perspective. It also helps to explain some of what I think is going on. Again, world building. So how did all this get started? Because... The doors, what's funny is I had a theory which was completely torpedoed because the doors need to be powered to get through them. If it wasn't for that one fact, this would all make perfect sense. But the doors need power to get through them. So that's torpedoed because they would need to already have the energy to get through the doors to be able to access. Blah, 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 blah. So I'm not going to get into the Pixar theory, although I do plan to pick that up in a minute, but rather... I want to talk about how it seems to me that what we have here going on, and by the way, I would love to hear your thoughts on what you think the world building is of this this series. It seems to me what we have going on here is a little bit of a masquerade, Harry Potter or Vampire the Masquerade style, that those in power amongst human society probably know about the monsters and their existence and kind of allow them to cooperate and coordinate as part of a international, if you will, deal. The monsters agree to sit over here in their world and do their thing. The humans sit over here and do their thing. The two have, and, and there's several tidbits that kind of help to em emphasize this. First of all is the lie about the toxicity of children, or the toxicity of humans in general. Now, it's entirely possible that there's various diseases and viri that humans would ca have that would cause issues for monsters. 
But the toxicity thing is way overblown. Why? It helps maintain that barrier between the two. It helps maintain the masquerade. Monsters will do everything in their power to avoid interacting with the human world, and this also means that they will ensure that the humans will not get too curious or wondering or whatever, and will not come back through the door and cause issues for the human world. Remember, one of the first things they mention right at the beginning is, what's the first mistake you made? You left the door open. And that's horrible because that means a human could have gotten back through. First thing they point out there. This would also help to kind of explain uh, sort of a mutual, mutual beneficial kind of a trade-off thing here. The monsters probably didn't discover scare electricity early on. But when they started discovering electricity, right about probably right about the time that the humans did, this could lead to what is effectively the creation of the monster world. This is where the, my own theory on this falls apart the most hard, because it pretty much demands the idea that they could craft or teleport to this other world, one of the two. And the other world, again, might simply be a pocket dimension, might not be a full planet, simply a small dimension. The alternative, though is that they always had the ability to access it, which has its own flaw. How did they do that before they could power the doors? You see why that's such a sticking point in so much theory crafting. If anybody has a way around the door problem, I'd be love, love to hear it. Because the problem is, at some point they discovered electricity, and at some point they figured out a way through, and at some point they then either left or started interacting with the human world. And that initial point of, of separation and connection between the two worlds is the biggest sticking point of why. Again, my theory is that there was a, an effort, both on behalf of the humans and the monsters, to go ahead and make slash find this other world. And because they had discovered the power of screams, okay, sure. So they discover the power of screams, use that to go over there, start setting up their own society and stuff. And they have the superstars... And this is consistently shown. These are effectively the, the movie stars, the sports stars, whatever you want to call it, of the monster's world. There's the people who go into the factory and work on that. Which actually makes perfect sense, considering how much of their society hinges on what they do. And serves as their connecting point back to the human world, which, culturally speaking, is important to them. Even if it's something they keep at arm's reach, that is still a point of cultural significance to virtually all monsters, right? And the propaganda machine is going nonstop constantly to maintain the illusion that we can't go back through, which further emphasizes the cultural ties, which then further helps to emphasize why these people are effectively superheroes. All of this lines up neatly, except for the freaking doors. So again, I'd love to hear your all theories if you have any. So <laughs> this then leads to the present. You know, they, they keep expanding. There's more monsters and they're developing and there's more of the city and they keep flushing out. More needs... More energy problems. Now, what's, well, we'll get to the rest of that later. But uh, you're probably wondering, why would the humans be okay with helping the monsters out inside of this? Well, there's two big reasons that come to my mind immediately. First is the relatively non-selfish reason. The, oh yeah, we'll help out another sentient sapient species in exchange for them, you know, effectively leaving us alone. Kind of a mutual self-interest thing. The other idea is that the monsters have either in, is result of some of their technology is basically sharing some of it in return, which could lead to things like sentient toys, for example. I'll go ahead and talk about it now. So everyone talks about the Pixar theory, right? Or Pixar theories, rather, because there's multiple of them. Having sat down and really thought about these films as we go, while the Pixar theories are neat, I really think it would be better to view them as more self-contained. While it is possible to include other Pixar films in these bundles, I think that Toy Story, Bugs Life, and Monsters, Inc., by themselves, with the possible inclusion of Finding Nemo, fit reasonably well just with that trio. I'm willing to go and just add Finding Nemo there, but I haven't watched Finding Nemo yet, so that's why I'm hesitant on that. Thus... The points between these three connect to each other sufficiently enough that we can understand and see why the world is the way it is. The Bugs Life thing fits in relatively neatly, but also is literally in the film, in this film, because there's a bit where Randall goes to the exact same spot, which is where uh, the city was that Flick went to go hire the circus bugs. 
Now, we know why that's there. It's because it's a way to save time and money, because it's already animated and yada yada. It's the same issue we had back in Toy Story 2. But it's the exact same spot. And again, it's also worth noting Bug's Life fits the easiest into everything else, because it doesn't really affect much. That then leads us to Toy Story. And Toy Story is partially fantastical in a way that many Pixar films are, but Toy Story also has the kind of pseudo-technological progression thing going for them, which also ties neatly into the idea of, let's call it what it is, a mystical energy source. At several points in time, Boo cries or laughs, and despite the fact that there's no cable connecting to her, just her act of doing that causes the energy to rise or spike in the nearby electronics. Now, while we have certain things that can work that way in real life, you can see how this is effectively magic at this point. And you see how this ties so neatly into Toy Story. Sense, Meg? My thoughts on the matter. And as ever, looking forward to yours. Moving on. <clears throat> so, uh... Looking at my thoughts here. Uh, so the film starts, and it's very, very smart about how it does things. The first thing they do is they have this big, scary moment, which lasts very little time. Just almost instantly gone. Turns into slapstick. And this then is followed by exposition to get across some of the things. There's a lot of quick and dirty exposition. At this point, I'm starting to think that's just a Pixar thing. <laughs> But either way, quick and dirty exposition and the slapstick quickly and effortlessly assures everyone, don't worry, these are not the bad guys. Notice how they portray them. They go out of their way to use, once again, the audio and visual presentation to get across points. The one dude is just kind of bumbling and doesn't really know what's going on. The woman at the thing is just kind of done with this and it feels like she's done this 30 times today. And everyone else is just sitting over there with their things, staring stupidly. All of this presents the same exact idea. These are non-threatening. This is one of the biggest points the movie makes over and over and over and over and over. And it will be a continuing point throughout the entirety of the two films. The monsters are not threatening. They're not supposed to be. That is indeed the entire opposite of the point. They scare because it's their job. There's no malice. None. With a couple of exceptions. And I'll cover that later, of course. I also want to give special praise to the animating team for obvious reasons, because they managed to make decent expressions on multiple people who do not have human faces. Harder to do than it sounds, so credit where credit is due. I watched Water News sometime and how they use the eyelids on his multiple eyes differently in order to emulate expressions. Just some cool stuff there. So, we then see the early dynamic and the value of support personnel. This is something that uh, Monsters University will emphasize even more, but Mikey clearly knows his stuff, and um, they also really try very hard to make it seem like the two have a good pairing. That have, they have, there's, it's one of those things that's hard to pull off, but you need to show that these people have been friends for a while when it's the first time we see them. And so they do a good job of that, and there's just a familiarity with them, both in the physicality and in how they talk with each other. Another value of having both actors in the booth at the same time. This then leads to the cutscene, excuse me, the advert, where... <laughs> I play too many video games. Where, they're, uh, where they start expositing even more. There's actually a lot of exposition in this, but they pepper it throughout the film, so I'm kind of okay with it. We find out uh, this the propaganda machine is on full support. Kids are absolutely terrifying. And they're, they're, they don't get scared anymore. Should cue a kid watching some violent TV. The humans don't quite look good yet. I would honestly say Incredibles is probably the first time they really nailed humans. Which is funny because they were very stylized in Incredibles, but I, I still think that's the first time they did a good job with it. But anyways. <clears throat> but they have... Um, they have that whole thing. They start talking about the scream shortage. That's the big one. They also do something else. This is a really minor point. While they show all of their currency as dollars... They also have three digits after it. Everything is ten nine ninety nine, or eight nine ninety nine, or four nine ninety nine, instead of just ninety nine. Really minor point, but they do that consistently in the in like the the magazines or the newspapers or just the food stalls. All of it has the triple digits thing. Very minor point, but a nice little thing I wanted to comment on. Also, the the value of almost everything is surprisingly low, which also makes sense if you have triple digits after your dollar amount. Because if you have a smaller point of currency, you don't need to go larger unless you're having rampant inflation. Let's not get into economics. Moving on. 
Um, <laughs> so then we have the Bugs Life City sequence. This is, again, a Pixar hallmark. As I already pointed out back in Bugs Life, this is something they do in almost every film they have. Okay, what if X were Y? Now, how do we show mundane, everyday stuff now that those rules have been changed? This is that sequence. They just walk through town, and you could tell the animators just had some ideas, and they just ran with all of them. It's cool, and I like it. I like it every time we see that in Pixar films. I just wanted to comment on it, because I don't have anything else to add to it. This then leads to Monsters, Inc. Please hold. Monsters, Inc. Please hold. Monsters, Inc. Oh, the memories. The horrible, horrible memories. I did not like being a phone person. Oh, my goodness. A tier zero. <clears throat> There's a sticker reminding him to file his paperwork. That's nice. This whole upcoming scene, I don't, there's so many details here. I feel like it would be doing you a disservice to just list them all. This is establishment. This this scene and the next scene uh, following do just establish so many rules and concepts and ideas, and they do so so brilliantly. This actually might be the best exposition that I have seen in the Pixar series so far, because almost all of it's visual, and almost all of it is just very quick and efficient and visually entertaining to watch. Um, they establish all of this stuff because we need to know what normal is. We need to understand the rules before we can understand what's going on in the film. Again, this is also when they really make it clear that the factory workers are effectively sports stars, which, as I pointed out earlier, makes perfect sense. Um, there's a little bit, it's a freeze frame thing, where he pulls up his, uh, the, the, the document, and we see it for just a second there. Now, unfortunately, because Disney Plus is incredibly stupid, I can't actually pull 4K onto my computer. There's a whole reason why, and it has to do with copy wrong. That's all I'm going to say. It's really dumb. I'm still looking into a way around it. So I couldn't, the re relevance here is I couldn't see all of the details on the stupid thing. However, there was a lot of detail there, including uh, whether or not he wets the bed, uh, his relative age, his sleeping times, and of course, how many times they've already scared this particular child and the number associated with his door. All sorts of information like that, which... This is the other reason that the masquerade idea and the cooperation with humans thing kind of makes sense in my head. The Because someone's gathering all this intel. Now, yes, they do have these doors, and yes, they could just go through them and gather the intel, but how do they determine, like, what happens when a new door is made? Or would it not be easier for there to be just a general universal standard of doors that the humans put into doors so that when a new door is made, they can track that door and say, okay, this is a door for you to check out. And there's like this whole section where they just add new doors and chunk and go through, do a sneaking mission, probably with someone like Randall. There's I, Now, this is probably all mundane and boring, and you hate me for even bringing it up. But I have to point out that this whole operation is actually exceptionally well organized, as it needs to be. These people need to interact with a specific door at a specific time to interact with a specific person to get a specific result across a planet. You'll notice they even have Eastern Seaboard, and they just they hit certain areas periodically throughout the day as, as they go through their work shift, and they follow the, the setting sun. This is a massive operation. Of course they need to have this level of paperwork. In fact, there's a very minor thing, which is probably just done as a gag, where Mike is telling, Mike, Mike Wazowski is telling uh, Sully how to file the paperwork. And it's just, it, it's do this, and this goes to 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 this, and don't do anything with this. And it's just like, okay. And he doesn't know any of that because he's not support personnel. That's not his job. It also is a very quiet mentioning of the fact that Mike is actually good at his job, even though he's a bit of a slouch. But I'll get to that in a minute. Either way. Very organized, lots of establishment, and some kind of sort of popping big band music. This is also a scene that is presented as positively as possible for the same reasons I kept emphasizing earlier. This is the scene where the monsters actually go through and start scaring kids from their closets. So it needs to be as bright and decent and high-toned as it possibly can be, because otherwise this would be straight-up terrifying. You'll also notice, and this is very important... All of the people involved, but especially Sully, are just yep, 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 getting a good day at work. You know what that's like, right? Oh, I hope you know what that's like. When you've when you've had a good day at work, when you've really gotten a lot of good stuff done, and you're you're just in the zone, you know? I've had days like that. So they're just, yeah, yep, they've got that thing going on. And there's just this sort of, yep, I got this kind of confidence slash groove they have going for. All of this 
helps to emphasize the exact same point over and over and over again. The monsters are cool. Now, <laughs> this probably sounds like a little bit of a joke, and obviously it is since I had the glasses ready to go, but I mean this with sincerity. You know, this, if you've seen my Diablo lore run, you know that I talked about this concept extensively. The whole point that the movie makes and remakes endlessly is that the monsters are cool. They don't really have any malice or malevolence. They're not something to actually be afraid of. They're, they're all right. That is important and will continue to be important going forwards. Now, I pull up my notes here. A little harder to read for some strange reason. We almost ha also have a little bit of a Gold Rube Goldberg vibe, which will be important later. So, we also see Sully, who is the go-lucky nice guy, in total contrast to Randall, who's a dick. And we see more establishment, more establishment at the factory floor. The door shredding policy. The fact that we've lost 58 doors just this week. All little quick exposition to get across what's going on. And then we see a two th uh, 2319 in progress. This is important, too, because it emphasizes just how quickly they respond to these kind of calls. They had to have CDA personnel basically there on site ready to go in order to respond to this. This would also make more sense if the, this is just one city instead of an entire planet, but I'm not going to get ahead of myself on that one. It would make sense, regardless if the CDA literally had a uh, an outpost, for lack of a better way to put it, there on premise in order to be able to respond to this kind of a thing. Because, duh, right? This is the point of biggest contention. This also helps to push the propaganda thing. But you noticed how uh, George, I think it was, the big furry guy, is fine, despite the fact that he has almost a solid minute and a half of having this supposedly very toxic thing on him. This is the kind of thing that makes the masquerade fall apart a little bit. Because anybody really thinking about it would probably notice rather quickly that it just doesn't apply. But you'll notice how so much effort is being put into emphasizing the propaganda line. The CDA agents actually do the thing where they seal it down to have it exploded, and then they, they buzz him down and they go, they just, it's this big, it's huge smoke and mirrors operation. And of course, that is how the best magic tricks work. You do something big and obvious so you don't notice the actual obvious. So, why is Roz on Mike so much? Spoilers, we find out later that she is part of the CDA and she is here and has been here for some time looking into some kind of operation. She's not really sure what's going on or who's behind it. She also mentions that she wasn't really aware that it was going all the way up to Water News. But she's been investigating certain, certain workers. This is important because remember... Monsters are cool. There's probably been reports of either kidnappings or unusual circumstances. In fact, in fact there was a cut scene or a cut uh, shot that isn't in the final film that was going to include just wait, wall after wall of cages to hold all the kids they were going to kidnap in order to rip screams out of them. Those monsters were not cool. So, <laughs> talk about that later. So the idea here being that obviously this has been something that's been building for some time. This just didn't happen overnight. But she's not really sure who to suspect yet. And Mike keeps forgetting to file his paperwork. So you can kind of see why she would suddenly have such an interest in him personally. Anyways, <clears throat> so, Boo is introduced. This is probably one of the more clever things the film does. Boo is a monster. Let me explain that a little bit. When, you, when it comes to movie monsters, there's certain rules they tend to follow. Uh, they can teleport off camera, they tend to be perfectly stealthy when they need to, and they they just Pwah! out of nowhere, and they, they usually operate in ways that frankly don't actually make sense. It's done to make them scarier, to show that they are supernatural in some way. In some cases this is ridiculous, like in The Walking Dead, where zombies are basically magic, the, the closet magic zombies that we've made fun of so many times. In other cases it makes perfect sense and lines up neatly with them being a horrifying monster, right? But that is exactly how Boo is presented. She, put, she fits every single trait. And while the scene is obviously being played for comedy, you could see how she is the monster here. And that's even ignoring Sully's reaction to her, where he is just constantly like, oh my god, no, and, and, and trying to run from her as much as he possibly can. This sequence continues for a little bit, and he is really stupid and tries to put the stuff in the toilet. What? 
Why the toilet? And then he puts it in George's locker. <sighs> Poor George. I suppose I should mention really quick uh, uh, Mary Gibbs. Is that Mary or is that May? Miss mm. Gibbs, who is the voice actress who plays Boo. Now, I don't want to make anyone sound old, but she's 24 now. <laughs> That's just, oh God, she was a literal toddler. She was two, one to two range when they were filming her here, recording her. And she was three when the film actually came out. The relevance? Well, what they would do, and this was actually brilliant in its own right, what they would do is they would just follow her around as she played in the pay play pens with the microphone and just recorded lots of stuff of her just, just being a kid. And then they would chop that out and edit it and work with it. And you can kind of tell if you know that and if you're paying attention to the film as you listen to her. You can tell she's just running around the playpen laughing and having a good time. And they just select the stuff and they would, they would just allocate, okay, this is this kind of reaction. This is this kind of reaction. Here's her being happy. Here's her being sad. Here's her being scared. Here's her laughing. Here's her chain. We need a couple of short shots when she just has one line. We'll put those over here. They just organized it out and distribute it throughout the film as needed. Good stuff, good stuff. Um, Sue, this is when... <laughs> <there's>... <laughs> I'm sorry. This film did actually make me laugh more than I thought it would. And that does surprise me for reasons I'll go into in just a moment. But they go to the restaurant. And, you know, they're all freaking out. And she runs and she's just like, boo! And they all go running and screaming. Once again, the horror movie monster. But you can see how this is all just a big game to the kid. In fact, I'm pretty sure I've done that exact same game with you know, kids as well. So that, that lines up perfectly. The, the, there's also the bit where the, the people talk about how she used her laser eyes and her mind powers to lift me up like a dog. Can, can, you, can you imagine a populace and a media that is so propagandized as to get facts so wrong? So, this is when uh, we see her crying cause electrical issues. Now, we actually saw this earlier. Earlier, Water News let out just a little bit of the screen canister, and we saw it affecting the electrical stuff. Again, magical energy. But here we see it with her directly, and then she laughs, which overloads almost... I, I don't want to say the entire grid, but you'll notice it doesn't even show us the full extent of how much the laugh affects the local electricity. It just turns everything on within the building, and then the next building, and then it cuts away back to the actual events. I do like that. So, this I want to talk about the construction of this film briefly. This film is weirdly well scripted. There's a lot of tight scripting to it. Uh, events flow very quickly. The exposition is very well done. The dialogue pops and works in almost every case. And there's lots of foreshadowing. Tons of tidbits throughout the whole film, which I'm not going to bother to point out every single one of them. Between Randall and how he's acting, they talk about the machine. There are certain works about uh, you know the energy crisis and how it's affecting them and how... Specifically how Waternoose will react to certain stimuli in ways that doesn't really make sense. The nature of Mike and Sully and their relationship, and of course the laughter thing. There's tons and tons and tons of buildup, and it's all fascinating, and it's all interesting. And what I find most fascinating about the whole thing is that this film seems the dumbest of the Pixar films I've seen so far. But it's clearly not. And so I sat back and I actually paused the film for a bit to try and figure out why. And I think I'd put the finger, I think I, think I could put my finger on it. This film is extremely slapstick. Now, I already talked earlier about how this film kind of was going for broad appeal. This is the biggest reason why. Most of the humor in this film is just straight up slapstick. It, it's, it's Three Stooges slash Looney Tunes. Now it works because the whole film goes for that tone. And the whole film uses that from literally the first scene in the film when we first see what's his face the new the new recruit who is going through the scare simulator bam slapstick right off the bat and that continues all the way to the second to last scene when they go to the laugh floor right so you can see how it doesn't really it, it's not objectionable because it's a, it's it's designed to be that it fits and how slapstick is one of the broadest forms of humor it's the kind of thing that the largest groups of people will find funny so I'm like, okay, 
Well, that's strange. So why is it still such a good film? Well, humor is only as good as it is applied. You'll also notice this film is probably the first one to really start to introduce uh, nice, tight, smartly scripted jokes. Actual, honest-to-God jokes, periodically. Which are usually going to go right over the kids' heads. It also is the first film to really start to deal with some actual, real-life, applicable adult concepts. Like an energy crisis, or a kidnapping, or you know, the, the bonds of two people falling apart, or being a parent. You know? The, now, granted, some of the previous films have touched on these topics a little bit. I'm not trying to say that they haven't. But this film goes full hog. I could be wrong about this, but this might be the first film that establishes the Pixar formula. The good for kids, good for adults thing. They've even talked about that in multiple interviews, and in a lot of their ad campaigns, they push that element. It's for kids and adults equally. And while that could be argued to be true of the previous three films, I mean, I'm 38 for God's sakes, and I enjoyed them well enough, the fact of the matter is, it feels like that was kind of unintentional, a byproduct of how they were making the films. Here it feels like they were deliberately aiming for that and managed to succeed. It'll be interesting to see what they do going forwards, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So, uh... Don't worry, I'm not going to scare you. I'm off duty. That's an important part. Because you could see in, in the casual, normal way he says it, he is so massively disassociated from what he does. It's so normal to him. So everyday to him that it doesn't occur to him for even a second that there is anything wrong with what he does. Why would there be? I mean, if you remember, even his dad was a big and popular scarer. This is something that Monsters University would introduce. So this is a generational thing at this point. There's also the picture of Randall. Nice little tidbit there. And this is the first time Banishment is mentioned. We're continuing to establish stuff if you're paying attention. We also specifically call out Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, and the Abominable Snowman. Haha, ha, by the way. Two points. Sully at multiple points, wants to do what he can to help things, usually on a, a large scale. We should walk to work. There's an energy crisis. And, you know, oh my gosh, if this gets out, the plant might get shut down. In both situations, Mike is the total opposite. Mike just wants to drive because it's his car and he wants it. And in the other situation, he's worried about himself and, and Sully and their personal lives, not the lives of the entire plant. Keep that in mind for later. Either way... This, uh, hang on. Oh, I'm sorry, we're going to race through, because, yeah, there's a lot of slapstick here. There's a lot of slapstick here. Um, that's, that's why I talked about that section here, because that was my only note for this entire, like, 20 minutes of film. This then helps, uh, well, th this then helps to establish why Mike is willing to work with Randall, despite the fact that, well, it's probably, let's be honest with ourselves, unethical. Now, he's not sure about that. I'm going, I'm willing to give him some credence here, but... Sully is like, no, I'm not dealing with this. And thankfully he does, because Randall then kidnaps Mike. Cute. This leads to something that isn't 100% perfectly right. And they're rehearsing a play. Oh, so help me, oh, so help me. I, by the way, if you haven't seen the actual play, or, or rather the pieces of the play, do yourself a favor. Go to YouTube. Go ahead and stop this video right now. Go, go over to YouTube and look up Monsters, Inc., uh, Oh, so help me play. Or put that, put that right back where you came from, or something, something like that. And you'll find it and just watch it. It's actually, it's great stuff. It's worth watching. Anyway, sorry. <clears throat> moving on, moving on. So, uh, this is, so Randall's like, oh, right, I'm cheating. Uh huh. Totally not planning anything bigger. This leads to their capture. This leads to the reveal. And, well, the whole movie has been building to this scene. The whole, and I'm dead serious here. This is another element of the script being very tightly scripted. Because the whole movie has been building up this point. That the monsters are cool. They're a little bit silly, and they're a little bit slapstick, and they're a little bit dumb. And they're propagandized into oblivion. But there, there's no malevolence. There's no malice. They're good folk, right? This then helps to contrast them. Because then we see Randall... And the kind of person he is willing to be, really, at Waternose, who is willing to be far worse, arguably. Now, 
Randall has really pedantic and selfish motivations. He's only caring about himself. And Waternoose is really only caring about the large-scale stuff. And yes, I'm directly comparing them to Mike and Sully. Mike, uh, Sully and Waternoose both have the large-scale perspective. Mike and Randall both have the small-scale perspective. The micro and the, or the macro versus the micro. But there's one other way that these four characters contrast each other interestingly. That's that my chair is in the wrong position. There we go. I need to get a better mat for this thing, because it, it's the, the, the wheels fall into sinkholes, and then I have trouble moving, and it's just really uncomfortable. Maybe know a good mat for this thing? It, don't answer it. I won't get this for like two years. Mike is usually correct. Not right. Correct. He usually makes the correct call in most situations. He is, after all, the thinker. Sully usually tends to be right. After all, he's the heart. He's the kind of person who just thinks about what's morally and ethically right, rather than what is practically and functionally correct. This then contrasts the other two. Randall is wrong, because he is someone who just wants to do whatever. He, Like I said, he is not cool. This, of course, leads to Waternoose, who is correct, or incorrect, as you might say. And incorrect would probably be more accurate here. And thus, but he's more focused on the practicality of it. He knows what he's doing is wrong, he just accepts doing it because he has to. Whereas Randall embraces doing the wrong because screw it. And you see the contrast between the four of them. It's, it's some nice stuff and it's some nice interplay. Either way, this leads to the actual reveal of the stream, the scream extractor. I want you to think about how horrifying that would be, really. Imagine you're waking up and you're like six, five, something like that. And you wake up and you're strapped into this device. And you look around and you're not sure what's going on. There's some monster operating a giant thing aiming at your face. And it clamps onto you and starts making it so you can't breathe. We actually see the effects of this because it seems to also at least partially suffocate the victim as well. Yeah, yeah, that would probably be legitimately horrifying. It would, it would also make sense if this was designed to be horrifying specifically to add to that horror. Yeah, that's that's lovely. This, of course, leads to uh, a, a really good scene. So up until now, Mike has been mo making mostly the correct calls, as I've already pointed out, but not the right calls. But then Sully's like, no, we're going to listen to me. We're going to do the right thing, and we're going to go to Water News, and we're going to tell him about everything. Now, obviously, Water News is in on it, and that leads to a big scene. But before we get to that scene, there's a much more important character moment. This one's here for the adults, really. Sully is fi finally convinced to go ahead and give an on, you know, an on-duty roar, and he does. And Boo is horrified, and he can't even properly process that. And the the film takes its time here. Brilliant pacing, by the way. A lot of these events have just been racing by, but the film pauses here. Not only for this scene, but the next and the one after that. To really give Sully, and the audience, time to process how bad this really is, even though the whole film has been portraying it as this nice, light, happy thing. But for the first time, the film actually allows us to see the consequence of what they're doing. The thing that everyone was so terrified about when they were making this film. Because monsters coming through your closet to deliberately scare you is a horrifying thing. And so now that they've done all this work and effort to diminish that, they show it full front. And then they let the, the movie breathe for a minute. And just let that sit there and percolate, simmer, just enough so that Sully and the audience can really process, oh my god. And you see how it takes Sully three separate scenes to come to grips with this, to, to, to understand this. And that makes sense, too. This is the kind of thing that he will probably haunt him for some time to come, to be completely blunt, because he's been scaring for years. He went to school to scare, for God's sakes. This is something that has been his career move. Imagine, if you can, something that you really care about. It's, it could be something you are doing, like, say, streaming for a living, or something that you want to do as, as like, a career, a real long-term career that you've wanted for so long, and you get into it, and it's, yeah, it's incredible and awesome, I'm finally doing it, it's amazing. Now imagine that you find out the kind of personal, terrible trauma that is causing to people. Picture that. 
if you can. That, that's powerful. That's good stuff. You see what I mean about the script and how tight this thing, I keep using that word. There's no padding. That's what that means. There's no, everything, all the wires are round around tight. It's a nice, cohesive thing without any loose ends and out any little things over here. I mean, it's not a perfect script, but that's what I mean when I say a tight script. It doesn't waste its time, and it knows exactly what it's doing, and it knows exactly how to do it. So they're banished. Mike is obviously really upset about this. You'll notice that, for the first time, their perspectives shift a little bit. Mike starts thinking about the macro. Obviously, he's upset about his life being ruined, but he's he's thinking about you know Celia and and the plant and his life and all this stuff that is never going to happen now because they've been banished to the human world. And there's only one thing, one thing that Sully is thinking about, and that's Boo. He is now focused entirely on the micro, and of course he is. I'm not saying that their perspectives have flipped. I'm just saying their priorities have shifted. When reality smacks us in the face, we tend to show a little bit more of who we actually are. Trust me, I should know. Mike reveals that he does care about things other than himself. Sully reveals that he feels so terrible about this that he is willing to torpedo everything for the sake of one person. Now, Mike is willing to do that too. After all, you know he's correct about many things. It's also interesting to note, and this is real, real, real props to Billy Crystal. While he does good comedic stuff, I, I don't usually think of him as a good serious actor. This scene proves me wrong. When things get real, he just lays it out. And you notice he has spent the entire movie BSing and schmoozing and lying. And he just lays everything out real flat. And it, again, it's a very powerful scene. Surprisingly so. Also, I want to just give massive praise to the scene out in the snowstorm. Snow, snow on fur, just, whew, brilliant stuff. Again, the kind of things that wouldn't even be possible prior to this very film. Again, massive props to the technological achievements here. This is also when we start to see a little bit of how Waternoose is villainous, but it's hard to qualify him as pure evil. Despite the horrible nature of what he's doing, it's clear he does not want to. This is not something that he has embraced, and this helps to distinguish him and Randall. Randall is like, Mwah. and Waternoose is like, very well. And yet Waternoose is arguably worse than Randall, because the thing is, Randall's mostly doing this for the kicks. That makes him a threat, but really no more threat than a thug. Waternoose is doing this with purpose. He has long-term aspirations and goals. He wants to industrialize terror. Think about that. And thus, even though he is shown in a better light, he is far more dangerous and has far more reaching negative consequences. So, there's this really cool scene. Mike and Sully make up, and th this, is, this is the cool part. It's right after that. Because what happens is Mike just is honest with Sully. He's like, come on, dude. And, you know, Sully... It manages to defeat Randall, and they rush off. Mike's like, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. Um, this then leads to Celia literally tackling Mike. And she's she's obviously livid, because the, all this crap has been going on, and no one's keeping it around the loop. And he's like, okay, fine. And he tells her the truth. It's funny, because what immediately happens is he tells her the truth, and is proven to be right immediately. And so she immediately goes and helps him, and all is forgiven. Because she now understands what's going on. Oh my god, a relationship issue was completely solved by proper communication. Do you know how rare that is? In real life, never mind in fiction. I know this is such a minor point to stick on, but I was actually impressed that they bothered with this. Because as soon as she realizes what's going on, she's it was just, it's context. It's like earlier. Mike is like, oh, I'm upset at you because you're not listening to me. Oh, you were being strangled by your enemy. And, and that context changes everything. Same thing. Oh, I'm angry at you for ruining my date and ruining my... Oh, oh, context. I gotcha. Go get him, googly bear. It immediately changes perspective because now you know more of what you're looking at. You understand it better. And with that proper communication, hey, ah, love it, love it. So then we get to the doors. 
I should probably pause a moment and talk about how the system they show for the doors makes absolutely no sense. It would never work. I, I, I hate to say that. Have you ever played Factorio or any game, <laughs> physical or digital, where there's a thing where you're trying to, to set up, you know, a factory line or a manufactory or some kind of management sim? You know, trying to set up trade lanes in a sim city or trying to set up, uh, hospital lines in, in, uh, a theme hospital or something like that. Anybody who's done any of that could look at this thing and be like, that's, that doesn't work. All right, we're done. Moving on. <clears throat> so they have the doors. Yep. Lots and lots of them. Lots and lots and lots. But that's appropriate. They do hit globally here, after all, for this one factory. By the way, the fact that they hit globally from this one factory is even more evidence for the fact that it's just the one city. I just wanted to point that out there. Anywho... We uh, we see how the doors are powered. They do some cool set piecing here. They do they play around with physics a little bit. Like there's a bit where he has to get up there and he has nothing to grab, so he opens the door and just grabs in on the floor there and then uses that to keep going. There's a bit where the door is actually on its side and they rush in and then land badly. And then of course there's the fact that when they're plummeting to their death, they just go in through the door in order to escape dying from impact. Cool stuff and cool sequencing. Very, very well storyboarded for the most part. But what I love most about this whole sequence is how Boo decides not to be afraid of Randall. You'll notice that she decides that. That's the important part. That is fear in a nutshell, isn't it? Oh, I'm not talking about, like, instinctual fear. There's actually several different types of fear, and I don't remember all the names right now. Please forgive me. I don't mean, like, oh my god, a snake is charging at me, or a T-Rex is, is going down the road or whatever. No, I mean, like, the general kind of fears that we usually think of when we say the word fear. Those things really don't have any power over us. They only have the amount of power that we let them. That That is how that works. That is how that has always worked. Now, that may, may, may not help in the moment because fear can be a very powerful thing, right? It's not an easy solution. This is something that fiction likes to play with a lot, too. You know, I'm only as powerful as you let me be, but we let them be plenty powerful. But because she decides not to be afraid, she beats the crap out of Randall. And I'll admit, that had me grinning pretty much the whole time. It also is a nice catharsis moment for the audience, especially the kids in the audience. Because remember, all the monsters in this film, with two exceptions, are cool, right? But Randall is not cool. And thus, Randall gets the crap beaten out of him by the kid. Very appropriate. But it takes the team to bring down the real villain here, Waternose. This is a nice sequence here. So he's, uh, he is the final monster, if you're paying attention. Once again, he is portrayed as a movie monster, just like Boo was towards the beginning of the film. The charging down the corridor, the thundering, the camera shots, the looking behind, terrified, slamming the door and putting the bar in it. All of this is classic monster movie stuff. And Sully's like, oh god, oh god, gotta hit the thing, gotta hit the thing. And if you pay attention, and I did catch this, he deliberately hits the wrong button when he goes through the door. So that's cute. Rushes through the door, and then Waternoose is there. Ha 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 ha! And meanwhile, off camera, Mike had convinced the people, the CDA people who were following him, to follow him over to the thing. It's like, shh. You get the strong impression that this was something they plotted out at some point, and it, were, it was probably they plotted out when they were coming back to the, the node, since that's when they enact the plan. I'd even say it was probably Mike's idea, since he tends to be the thinker of the two. This scene gets a good laugh out of me. I'll kidnap a thousand children if I have to! This once again shows why he is not cool, and why the rest of the monsters are. Even amongst monsters, kidnapping is pretty badly frowned upon. And this is clearly very, very illegal. As it should be. So. The film starts to wrap up. Uh, this is when we run into the Pixar tears moment. Uh, why, why shred the door? This is, in my opinion, one of the only flaws of the film. Because they shred the door and then they undo the shredding of the door. Now that's a nice gesture and it does show some of the time passing. That's cool. But why shred the door to begin with? Well, the answer is so we could have that bittersweet, oh, no. I, I really legitimately feel that at this point, the Pixar tears thing had become a thing, probably from A Bug's Life onwards, like I theorized, but definitely from Toy Story 2 onwards. And so they had to have the Pixar tears moment to keep the company running. And so, you know, they go ahead and they have the Pixar tears moment. 
Mike moves up to being a laugher. The ending is almost sickeningly happy. It's actually silly. I'm I'm okay with it. I'm good I'm good with the downright happy ending. But uh I find myself wondering if their continuing expansion is eventually going to outpace the laughter that they're pulling out of kids. Just random thoughts for the future. But I suppose that's a problem for a different time. And then of course the epis- the movie ends on Kitty. <sighs> yeah. And that's the end of Monsters, Inc. You can see again how I consider this to be a little bit of an end of an era, because there's also the possibility, however small, of continued interaction between the human world and the monster world, which is something that kind of hints at you know, you know a, a total status quo change, which is something that isn't really showcased after this point, unless we count onward, but we're not going to, for obvious reasons. I like this film. Despite its flaws and its leaning heavily on slapstick, the, the, the gold skeleton underneath it shines substantially through, and I was more impressed than I thought it would be. As always, looking forward to your thoughts, and I will see you next time.